Oh, here we are live. Hello, everybody. Paul Ducklin from Naked Security at Sophos, uh, back on Facebook Live. Once again, I'm in the countryside. I'm out for my ride. It's been a gorgeous day, so I've actually had quite a good trip of it. And I thought I'd stop somewhere that at least shows that summer has arrived. Those of you familiar with the English countryside will know it goes very yellow at this time of year. That's uh, oilseed rape. That's where a lot of our cooking oil comes from. Well, not from that exact field, from that field and many like it. If you're in North America, I don't think you call it rapeseed. I think that your marketing guys figured that wasn't a very nice word. It's what you guys call canola. And I, if you're from Saskatchewan and you're watching, then I know you're probably looking at that and saying, hey, that ain't a field. That, uh, but to us it is a field and there's nice woodlands around and place for the wildlife to live. So happy summer everybody if you're in the northern hemisphere and hey we've got oh good morning from Arizona that's from Karen hello Karen welcome back so if I have to step forward it's because the characters are very tiny on my phone so let's crack on um, I was going to sing a song about it's actually the earliest known song in early middle English which is summer is a coming in but I'm not going to do that because I've spent enough time telling you about how we get our our, our cooking oil in the in the United Kingdom. So let's crack on with today's topic. I think it's important for a reason that I'll explain in a moment. As you see above, the title says 2FA, is it worth the hassle? So 2FA, that stands for two-factor authentication. Those are the codes that you one-time codes, that's usually how they're implemented. The one the, the one-time codes that come every time you log in, they either come to your phone or you generate them on your phone usually and you type them in and get logged in. Hey, hi from Prague. Who's that? That's Zuzana. Hello, Zuzana. Uh, stepping up to the mic again. Sorry about that. Um, so basically, the idea is that instead of just having a username and a password, there's an extra code, something that isn't generated by a computer, that's generated in some other way. That's why it's called two-factor. And the theory is that it makes it much harder for the crooks because if they fish your password, your username and password, which they could do if they get malware on your computer or if they trick you to going to a fake site, if they rush to try and log in as you, they're not going to be able to do so because they won't have the one-time code, only you have got that. So the idea is it's a little bit of extra hassle for you, a lot of extra hassle for the crooks. Now, in the recent Naked Security podcast, by the way, if you don't listen to Naked Security podcast, please give us a try. Uh, find, just search for Naked Security podcast on your favorite audio feed. It's uh, a little bit of lighthearted fun for lockdown season, but with a very serious side where we do teach you about security. And in the last episode, we discussed two-factor authentication and whether it should become compulsory and could it become compulsory. And in particular, Anna wanted to talk about Epic Games. He's saying, hey, we've got this cool new free game, but the enticement is if you want to play this game, you have to agree to turn on two-factor authentication, take the extra hassle of logging in. And we had a little bit of an argument on the podcast about why this apparently simple technique that makes passwords alone no longer good enough for the crooks. You think that would be a very, very strong defense indeed and that everyone would go for it. We had a little argument about why people aren't adopting it in droves. And Anna and Mark argued strongly that it's actually because a lot of people, they just don't know about it and they don't care and they don't realize it's important, so they just haven't bothered. And I took a different approach saying probably many people have heard of it. I think we're both, we're both sort of right. I think it's a significant minority fall in each camp. And my argument was that actually a lot of people know about it. They may even have to do it with their bank, for example. It's something they've got used to with the bank, this extra sequence they have to go through. That's very common in the UK, at least these days. If you're doing online banking, when you want to pay money, you have to go beyond your password. But they kind of go, look now, I've got this whole list of reasons. If I go online and I search, I can find a whole list of excuses not to do this second factor of authentication. Well, one is some of them work by sending you an SMS to your phone. So I have to give somebody like Facebook or Twitter or someone like that, I have to give them my phone number. That's a terrible idea. I ain't going to do that. So I can't use two factor authentication. You can have an app instead that runs on your phone that generates the codes based on a sequence setup when you created the account. And people go, oh, well, what if I lose my phone? What if I leave it at home? What if I'm in a place where I don't have my phone? Well, you know, how often do you leave your phone at home? Most people that I know tend to have their phone glued to them when they go out because it's very, very handy to have it. Particularly these days when you're not going out that often, you might be going to the shops. Uh, you know, you, you, if, you, if you get into trouble, you don't want to have to go to speak to somebody and, 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 and you might want to call for help in a more trusted way. So generally you do have your phone with you. And of course, the last reason that people give if they do know about this two-factor authentication thing and they still think it's a bad idea is they say, you know what? 
what I've read, well, it's not that great. The crooks have still got ways around it, which is true. We'll get to that in a moment. And it's a real hassle because it takes me longer to log in and it's a real pain. I have to do it for every account and it's really annoying. And, you know, it's 10 seconds here and 15 seconds there and 30 seconds there. I can't be doing with that. Username and password have served me well for ages. They'll serve me well um, forevermore. So for those of you who, who are in that camp that haven't heard of two-factor authentication, well, it, as I said, it takes many forms. If you're in the UK, I've, I brought a little swag bag with me today. Um, you might have seen one of those. That's an authenticator device. A lot of banks use these. Um, they're, they're not specific to a bank. It has a little slot at the top. You put your credit card in. You put the pin on your debit or credit card in, which authenticates you against the chip on the card. And then the bank sends you a code. You type in the code and it uses the chip on your card, which is very, very, very hard to clone. You should assume it's effectively impossible. And it uses that to generate a code that you then send back to the bank that proves that you're in possession of your card. You've got the pin on your card and the card has performed this calculation. So you're probably not a crook. You might be a crook, but it's comparatively unlikely. In other words, just getting the password isn't alone. Alone isn't enough. Uh, for other people, you know, you, you may have, I, I'd show you a mobile phone, except mine's taking the film here. But um, of course, even if you have one of these, that's a, that's a phone that I bought for, I think I paid $9 for that. And then about, about 20 cents a month to keep the SIM going. That kind of phone is enough to receive SMSs and some two-factor services the idea is you log in you start logging in or you go to the bank and you start withdrawing from the cash point and it sends you a message do you really want to do this yes or no or there's a code there that you type in and that's very very convenient because it means that hacking your laptop isn't enough the crooks have to get your phone or they have to get your sim card as well now you hear a lot of people say oh that's a rubbish way of doing two-factor authentication and it undermines the whole purpose of 2fa because everybody knows that you can get things called sim swaps which is where the crooks go into a mobile phone shop and and they say, I want to buy a new phone. By the way, I want to switch my SIM from the old phone to the new phone. And they pretend to be you and they get a SIM card with your number on it. Your phone goes dead. They get your messages until you notice and deal with that. That is a problem, but it's much less likely that someone is going to SIM swap your phone and steal your password than that they are simply going to steal your password, which could happen in a data breach. So the point of two-factor authentication is it doesn't mean that you don't have to do anything else. It's not an excuse to say, oh, well, I'll adopt it and then I don't need a password. That's the first factor. The second factor is the phone. So don't turn 2FA into 1FA by saying I can, I can give up on all my other security precautions. If you do adopt it, it doesn't mean that what you're allowed to do is say, oh, well, now I'm safe against things like phishing. So if I go to a website and put in my password incorrectly because of two-factor, then I don't have to worry about that anymore. You still want to be vigilant against phishing because on many phishing sites you actually give you actually give other things away as well for example while you're giving while when you by the time you get to typing in your password which may not be enough anymore for the crooks you could accidentally have given away name address phone number and other stuff that could be useful later in identity theft so the burning question I guess is why am I suddenly talking about 2FA now when again even though we've talk, talked about it many times in the past and one of the reasons is that the Department of Homeland Security in the US they have a division called it's quite a mouthful cyber cyber security and infrastructure security agency CISA uh, for short and what they've done is they put out essentially an alert about setting up Microsoft Office 365 correctly. Now, this is not a pop at Microsoft. They're not taking a dig at Microsoft. It's not a flaw in Microsoft's products. In fact, they praise Microsoft for one of the tools that they've created, which make it hard for you to set up Office 365 incorrectly if you have the will to do so. Obviously, they're concerned they didn't actually use the word coronavirus or COVID-19 in the article because it's kind of a timeless article. The advice stand, it stood yesterday, it stands today, it'll stand tomorrow. But obviously, their concern is that these days people are rushing to adopt cloud-based solutions very quickly and haste in getting things set up in cybersecurity actually leads to many, many a problem. And the, the, they feel that two-factor authentication is sufficiently important for business for people accessing business information, that it actually appears not once but twice in their, there are about 10 tips there. It appears right at the top where they say, make sure you start by setting it up for all your system administrators while you're configuring the system. And then as you go along, about fourth on the list, it's, oh, and by the way, get your users to use two-factor authentication as well. 
So the bottom line is that two-factor authentication will not magically make you secure against all attacks the crooks may have. Obviously, they can get you to a phishing site, they can get you put in a password, and they can have a message saying, your phone's about to receive a message, type in the number, and then they get the number and they put in the number on their screen. So they can still trick you by using phishing techniques with two-factor authentication, but it's much harder. They can't get your password and then just log in as you over and over and over and over again as often as they want. So if CISA in the United States is saying, look, set this up, guys, start as you plan to continue, set it up for your system administrators. Those are the people who can reconfigure the system. Make an extra layer of complexity, admittedly, for them to get in. It'll make it much harder for the crooks to take over and do things like ransomware attacks, and then apply it to, apply it to everybody, all the users that you add later. So their argument is not that 2FA solves all problems, not that Microsoft Office 365, that would be, you'd have to be, you'd get 100 days off here. Not that Office 365 has this security bug, that's not why they're doing their alert. What they're doing is saying there are some basic things that you need to get right, and the place to get them right is at the beginning. So if you have or obviously you do have accounts that you use at home like you may already have to use two-factor authentication for banking and you may feel it's a little bit of an extra hassle to use it for things like twitter and facebook and instagram and the online games you play but given that it makes the crooks harder if you don't adopt two-factor authentication you're actually sort of saying hello and giving a nice happy wave to the crooks so one motivation for adopting two-factor authentication is if you don't like cyber crooks if you want to see them if you want to see them taken down a notch, just like we do at Naked Security, then adopting two-factor authentication, it's worth it for that alone. But it does mean that you're less likely to get your own account hacks, hack, own accounts hacked. And if your work comes along now and says, I know that we haven't asked you to use two-factor authentication before. I know it's when you were in the office, everyone saw it as an unnecessary hassle. They could leave their phone behind. They could forget the token that they needed. All kind of, we just didn't bother with it, but we are doing it now. Please don't run screaming and go, oh, no, it's going to be too difficult. I might lock myself out. It might be too terrible. I think that you will find that if you adopt it as part of your digital lifestyle, you will start to feel essentially naked and exposed when you're setting up accounts that make it so easy to log in that all you need is a password. Because anybody who has received one of those crass and hideous porn scam or sextortion emails lately, it probably had a password of yours in it if you received. Now, it may be a very old password. It may be from a data breach five years ago, so it's not really a big deal now. But bear in mind, if those crooks, the lowest rung of the ladder, the sleazebags who are sending out millions and hundreds of millions of messages to say, I caught you watching porn, I'm blackmailing you, or I'll tell your friends. If those guys can actually get a password of yours that you had, even if it was five years ago, bear in mind that password words aren't secure enough on their own. Anything you can do to it, raise the bar against the crooks, even a little bit. If we all do it, the bar goes up like in high jump. It goes up exactly the same amount all the way along. And in my opinion, that is the best way to take the fight back to the crooks. We all lift our game a little bit. So that's my sermon, if you like. So here endeth the sermon about two-factor authentication. Don't dig your heels in. It doesn't solve all known problems, but it does make the world a safer place. Thanks for watching, folks. Uh, I, I, I wasn't able to read all of your comments. If you've got any questions, even if you're watching later, please put them in the comments below. We make a point of going back over, over many days after the Facebook Lives have been live to answer questions that you have. And until next time, stay secure. And once again, the finish button. I'll be in trouble with Mark for not singing that early Middle English song. Maybe next time. <laughs>